Hello, my name is John Maddox, and uh, I've been charged with uh, giving the uh, British Cattle Breeders Club a little rundown on our use of British cattle in our ranching business here in Nebraska. Today, our uh, ranch has uh, evolved into a different system where we no longer are primarily feeding cattle, but we operate as a cow-calf operation. And in that cow-calf operation, we carry all of our calves over as yearlings. In other words, we'd have a, a cow that would uh, have a calf in roughly the, in a May time frame, calving out on green grass. And we would carry that calf all the way till the next spring. And then we would send them to grass and send, about a, send them to grass for about 120 days. And then try to market a yearling steer or a heifer that might weigh 900 pounds at a roughly 17 or 18 months of age. We found that that system, that business model, really fits the feeding infrastructure, cattle feeding infrastructure of the United States. There are big, huge um, cattle feeding enterprises that are looking for uniform sets of feeder cattle that they can put into their feed yards and feed with, uh, with good performance and uh, low uh, problems, low overheads, low sickness, that sort of thing. So we um, exited the cattle feeding business, feeding cattle to um, slaughter weights, and now we are servicing the cattle feeding industry by creating big volumes of uh, yearling cattle that uh, can be uh, readily go into a feed yard and be fed out by the feeding complexes. Our ranch is really based upon our native range. Uh, the ranch itself is about 30,000 deeded acres. In addition to that, uh, we will run uh, rent about uh, 15 to 20,000 acres here locally. And on that native range, the real uh, base of our, our business is our cow herd. We'll run about uh, 22 to 2,500 head of mother cows that will calve every spring. We do it a little later than most people. We don't, uh, we try to calve at a time of the year where there aren't much, there isn't much risk from snow, blizzards, um, cold weather. There were, we're, we're um, calving out on green grass and that uh, minimizes the stress and the death loss and the facilities necessary to calve them out at an earlier time of the year and uh, greatly reduces the amount of uh, stored feed and nutrition that we have to put into our cow herd. Our system is facilitated by the use of byproducts we will uh, use both uh, wet distillers grains and dry distillers grains, which are byproducts of the ethanol industry. There, there is government policy to encourage ethanol production in the US to, uh, to use as a, as a blended product with gasoline. And uh, with, some of those, uh, with some of those subsidies, and government policies, there's a large number of ethanol facilities across the Midwest. And we try to take advantage of the byproduct, the wet cake and the dry distillers grains that are used um, or that are byproducts of that ethanol production. So in that, uh, in that business model we have, we, uh, we carry everything over as yearlings. All of our home raised, which you saw earlier, were red. But then we also will buy three to 4,000 head of, of mainly black and red Angus calves. We will wean them. And after they're weaned in the fall, 
we will take those, um, those yearling calves, take them out to corn stalks, the, the, bio, the, the result of uh, uh, corn production, the, the crop aftermath after corn is harvested, uh, and turn those cattle out on corn stalks. They then eat the forage, which is mainly the leaves and the shucks of the corn plant. And then we supplement them with the wet distiller's grain and dry distiller's grain uh, as they're running out on corn stalks. In that way, we don't have a, a big amount of facility to winter our yearlings, both our home raised and our purchased. We have, uh, make them graze and hustle during the winter. And, uh, and then we provide enough wet distiller's grain to provide for a modest growth, maybe a pound of gain per day um, for, uh, for the time they're out on corn stalks. So most of these uh, purchase cattle are Angus steers uh, and some heifers. They are, uh, we're trying to find that animal that will grow to um, a 900 pound, 950 pound animal at about 18 months of age. And that requires us to use British breeds, British breeds that tend to be more early maturing in their type and less high growth, because we could certainly use a continental breed, a Charlet, a Semmental, um, one of these other higher growth breeds in our yearling production However, when we get around to marketing those yearlings at about 18 months of age, if they weigh over a thousand pounds, they're heavily discounted in the marketplace. Feed yards want to buy an animal where they can put on four to 500 pounds. And even though those higher growth cattle might be a little more efficient getting to that yearling weight where we'd sell them, we give it all back because the, the cattle are discounted. The feed yards don't want to feed those larger frame, larger growth yearlings. They want that uh, something that weighs, that steer that weighs something under a thousand pounds. So using British breeds is important to target that weight that's acceptable uh, for feed yards to uh, put in their feed yards to uh, place and, and then uh, eventually sell at slaughter weights. So in our system that uh, those cattle are run out on corn stalks and we will go out and feed the wet distiller, primarily wet distiller's grain, just fed out on the ground. And we think that that is one of our little competitive advantages in our area is that we can winter a calf fairly cheap because of the avail availability of a lot of corn stalks around our ranch, plus the availability of wet distiller's grains as a supplement. It doesn't have to be fed in a bunk. It can be fed just um, out in the middle of the field. And it provides for a relatively low cost system to winter a calf for eventually going to uh, grass the following um, spring. Here's just a little basics of the economics of corn stocks. We can rent corn stocks for $20 an acre. We get about 70 calf days per acre. So that costs us about 29 cents a head a day for renting of the corn stocks. We have a little yardage um, cost that, that's just basically care building the single wire electric fence around the corn stalks. We figure that's around 20 cents. Uh, at today's prices, uh, our distiller's cost is around 60 cents per head per day. Uh, we pay, we put a little remincin mineral out at eight cents a day. So total cost of about $1.15. If we can get a pound and a half of gain, that means about a 77 cent cost of gain for those steers running out on grass. And that would be um, something uh, less than if we had them locked up in a growing yard in a growing feeding operation, fed a silage and 
corn ration, where maybe that cost of gain would be up closer to a dollar a pound. So we can think that's a cheaper um, alternative. One of the real added benefits of that though, is that those cattle that are running out in the wintertime, that are out hustling and grazing every day, they are better suited to go to grass that following year because they know how to hustle. And there's certainly, we have noticed a behavioral aspect that if a steer is out, up and around a feed yard at a bunk waiting for a feed truck to deliver the feed, they're not nearly as aggressive that following year as we turn them out on grass. They learn that they have to go out and hustle for feed as they're grazing all winter. And we feel like that especially improves their grass performance because of that behavioral um, pattern that they've uh, got in in, in a uh, extensive grazing situation. In addition, um, the cattle come off the corn stalks at a relatively lean um, body condition, and that allows for good compensatory gain if we have good green grass to turn them out on. So we feel like uh, the running our yearlings out on corn stalks provides an improved performance as we send them to grass the following summer. So our wintering system prepares the steers for summer grass. Most of our summer grass for yearlings, again, as a reminder, our home ranch, we winter or we uh, just uh, run our cow-calf herd um, of 2,500 cows. But we lease uh, ranches in Wyoming where we send our yearlings to go to grass and uh, we winter the cattle here close to the ranch and it's probably a two or 300 mile trip to, uh, to get to some of the grass in Wyoming where they are summered. We then sell them on a video auction to the large feeding complexes and uh, at, at as weight of as hot, as close as we can get to a thousand pounds. Anything that weighs 900 pounds or more up to a thousand pounds where we start to get discounted. So that's been our business model. Usually we will market about four or 5,000 head of these yearlings off of grass in Wyoming. In very extensive conditions, I might add, uh, on one of the ranches we run uh, as many as uh, 21, 2,200 steers on a couple hundred thousand acres of rangeland. So here on our home ranch, again, native range is our base uh, resource that we try to take advantage of. We, uh, we have an intensive grazing system with a very um, extensive watering uh, facilities for our pastures. We probably have 250 miles of pipelines and submersible wells pumping water all over the ranch into uh, different pastures that would roughly be a half section, 320 acres in size. And uh, again, about roughly about, uh, about 32 to 35,000 acres that we would graze with those 2,500 head of cows. Plus we try to run about a thousand replacement heifers uh, in addition to our base cow herd. So those that cow herd, we really uh, try to get good use out of the corn stalks as well. For a cow that would be calving in May, we typically in the in prior years have tried to wean those calves in an October, November time frame, and then we will send the cows out to corn stalks and make them graze corn stalks all year up until April excuse me, without any supplementation. We can do this because we, the cows can sure pick up a little corn that's left over in the field. They're very good about selecting the very best uh, nutrition out in the field, picking the leaves and the husks and really leaving the stalks. And uh, one other 
aspect of uh, corn stalk grazing that we think really helps our situation is that we run relatively large herds. So we might run 800 to 1,000 cows in one herd, graze them on one center pivot of, of corn stalks, 130 acres, and only have them in that field for maybe six or seven days. And then we will get horseback and move that those cows to another corn field where we they are allowed to get to a new a new shot of fresh corn stalks. And because we um, have that big number of cows, it improves the body condition on those cows because those cows are might be in a corn stalk field for five or six days, but they're only a few days away from a fresh field and potentially another shot of uh, corn that can be harvested uh, as they pick it up in the field. If you just turn 50 cows in on that 130 acre center pivot, she might eat, the cows might eat the corn in the first week, but the last three weeks, they're eating nothing but uh, leaves and chucks. So having large numbers for short periods allows for better condition, better nutrition, and there isn't a yo-yo effect of, of the nutrition being high and then tapering off significantly. They stay on a relatively level plane of nutrition as they're grazing. So that allows for running cows out on corn stalks without any supplement. I'll just quickly go through this. The basic uh, economics of corn stalks are similar to what they were on our yearlings. Rents $20 an acre. We get about 35 cow days per acre. That costs us 57 cents a head a day. We've got about 25 cents yardage, just the overhead of building fence, taking care of them, moving them. Um, uh, three cents a mineral a day for a total cost of 86 cents a head a day, which is a, an AUM cost, an animal unit per month cost of $25, which is very competitive. When you look about feeding a cow, if you just had to feed her hay or silage or some kind of ration, we would look at that at least double what it is if we we're out grazing. So again, having that winter grazing resource of corn stalks really benefits our system. We've been sending cows to corn stalks since 1975, and uh, we've never gone with any kind of supplementation uh, unless there is severe snowstorms. Since 1975, we've only been snowed out three times that we had to uh, bring the cows home. Again, large numbers improve the body condition score. Um, Grazing is encouraged in our area because uh, with no-till farming practices, farmers like us to take away the trash, take away the husks and the, uh, and the leaves so that they can go in and no-till corn directly into those corn stalks. And it does, allows them not to have any tillage um, for uh, going back into a, a new crop in the following year we take away the trash and allows for the, uh, the planting process to happen without any additional tillage. Um, we do have seen more competition as we rent these corn stalks. Again, I think this year we're gonna rent about 20,000 acres of corn stalks. The dairies have been aggressive about buying baled corn stalks and drought is always a competition where uh, cattle come in from the drought stricken areas and are competitive in bidding up the price and competing for corn stocks. But for us and our corn stocks, relationships are key. A lot of the people we rent corn stocks from, we started renting from in the late 70s and we've stayed with them from a, on a multi-generational basis. So we think that that is a key and we work hard to maintain those strong relationships with our corn stock customers. So we have this good winter resource of uh, corn stocks. 
But, you know, to really take advantage of them and graze them again with a dry cow without supplementation, we have to have a type of cow that would really uh, do well. So that is really important that we build our British type cow into our, our production scheme. And as we have uh, gone through that weaning of the calf and, and uh, sending a dry cow out to corn stalks without supplementation, we've realized that you know, maybe we're missing something by not sending a pair to corn stalks, sending a cow and calf to corn stalks. However, in that situation, even though we have that British type cow, which is a little smaller, a little less high production than say uh, some of the continental breeds, it allows us to run that pair out on corn stalks with a little supplementation where that calf is wintered with its mother. We realized what's the, what's the sense of weaning the calf, sending the cow out to corn stalks, and then running a calf out on corn stalks and supplementing the calf. Let's just run the pair all winter and then wean that calf when it's nearly a year old off of about 11 months of age, wean the calf off the cow when we come back from corn stalks. So that's been our new um, part of our, of our production model is that we will send uh, pairs to corn stalks on our home raised cattle, obviously. And uh, that allows us to have a very cheap wintering system. The basic economics there is we think that we can put a calf out with its mother and we can gain, uh, we can have a cost of gain around 45 cents per pound, which is roughly half of what it would be if we had a full backgrounding ration, feeding a total mixed ration to that calf. So we feel like it's um, a better health for the calves. They have the, the ability to winter that, uh, spend that winter with their mother. Um, uh, it can be a little bit of variable um, calves when you end up uh, with the calves at uh, 11 months, but we found we've made able, been able to make it work. Um, I, I can't tell you how, how uh, easy it is to wean a calf when it's 11 months of age, as opposed to weaning it at four or five months of age. It's just a lot less stress. It's a lot less stress on the cow, the calf, the health of the calves are better. And we just find it a, a, a far more um, low input and low uh, stress kind of system to wean them at the, those later dates. We also feel like those heifers that are wintered with their mothers also behaviorally learn how to be out and be aggressive about grazing, as opposed to if we weaned the calf and had them in a feed yard and we're feeding them a total mixed ration, they're not learning from their mother how to graze corn stalks and how to be aggressive uh, foragers in the wintertime. So we feel like that calf learns from the cow and that has improved our performance of our replacement heifers after we get them bred as a yearling, as they're coming on as a two-year-old, it allows us to, uh, to that heifer to be, more, um, to be more productive out on corn stalks because of that learned behavior of how to graze look close there, you can see that calf with a corn stalk right in its mouth, just as his mother has one. So it's a fairly extensive uh, operation. Um, we have uh, a rent about this year, this is a little dated, we've rented over a hundred quarters, a quarter is 160 acres, and uh, they would uh, be anywhere up to 25 miles away from the home ranch. The home ranch is uh, the deeded acres are noted in pink here. And uh, we would run some cattle out 25 miles to the west near the Colorado line. And then 
25 miles to the north and east, which should be uh, up uh, near North Platte, Nebraska. And then we um, send those cows out mainly by truck, uh, mainly by truck. And then we hopscotch our way back with uh, those cows to reach the home ranch uh, and moving them quite often. Um, usually about every week, each bunch is moved. And we do that on horseback with a crew of uh, seven to eight cowboys uh, moving those cows uh, during the winter. So we don't really have much, much labor, or hardly any labor that's really devoted to feeding. Most of our work is building in the wintertime is building and taking down electric fence that we build around these rented corn stalks and then being horseback moving cattle from pivot to pivot. So here's a rough head count of what we have on those 85 quarters. Again, this is a little dated in this uh, video. Um, we had about 5,300. I just looked at an updated number here and we had about 6,500 head of cattle uh, running out on corn stalks um, this winter. So it's a big part of our, uh, of our system. As you can see, we, uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's no snow or snow out on the ground, we make the cows kind of do most of the work themselves. We don't want to go out and feed them. It's, uh, it's far cheaper. And we just feel like if we can condition those cows, they learn how to uh, be out there and find feed, dig through the snow. And uh, uh, we just really have not much problem with that. Uh, when we have the cows conditioned accordingly. So equipment is an important part of uh, feeding these uh, yearlings and in, and in our case also feeding our cow-calf pairs running out on corn stalks. If we have snow or muddy conditions or, or uh, anything like that, we need to have a, a um, equipment that will handle it. And again, we're driving out in a field and out in, a, in rougher areas. So it's not a feedlot environment. It's uh, an environment, in this case, we take a six by six truck, a six wheel drive army truck, and then deliver that wet distillers out into the field, uh, fed right out onto the ground. So here's, um, here's kind of the coup de gras of my presentation. Um, why this system works for us is that we have tried to develop our maternal line of composite cattle with British, mainly British inputs to the composite in order to facilitate this business model. Again, a high growth, high production type cow can't get by on a full year round grazing program like we have. And again, if we would wean the calves in the fall, we would never even supplement that cow. We'd make a graze uh, summer range all during the summer and graze corn stalks in the winter without any supplementation. Obviously, if she's lactating and has a calf, that takes a little extra uh, feed resource to go into that lactating cow. But that can only be achieved by having modest levels of growth and milk. And we have found that the maternal traits we are looking for are really uh, best found in those British breeds of cattle. So our cows average around 1,100 pounds going to corn stalks, mature cows. If we have a pair, that calf weighs about 420 pounds when it's going out with its mother. Our coming three-year-olds might weigh just 1,000 pounds going to corn stalks. And our coming twos, who are yearlings, just coming off their first year of grazing, first breeding, would weigh about 870 pounds. So it takes genetics to fit year-round grazing and five months on 
corn stalks. So the main breed that we uh, start with our composite is Red Angus. In the United States, Red Angus is a more modestly sized, less high growth kind of animal. There's been a huge movement in the Black Angus breed for producing better carcasses, higher growth, more terminal type cattle, as opposed to concentrating on the maternal traits. And we found that the, the Red Angus breed has been more oriented towards commercial cattle producers and has been more um, modest in their uh, emphasis on growth and carcass traits. So our composite is roughly three eighths Red Angus. The one continental input that we've used is a Tarente breed which as far as size and scale and growth would be similar to most of the British breeds, but it, uh, it is a very maternal breed uh, from the Alps of, uh, of Southeastern France. Um, we just really like the maternal aspects and the fertility that we get out of our Tarente breed. And and uh, I would criticize them maybe being a little bit, uh, perhaps a touch more milk than, uh, than would be optimum for our environment and our system. They, our composite is roughly a quarter of the Tarente breed. Then we have three additional um, British breeds that we used, have used. Uh, we'd have about an eighth South Devon in our uh, composite. South Devon breed brings great carcass quality, maternal traits, um, perhaps a touch more milk and growth than we'd prefer, but they make a, a positive contribution to our composite. We've also used Red Pole. Uh, out of some of the studies that were done at the Meat Animal Research Center at Clay Center, Nebraska, they've uh, documented extremely high fertility in uh, the red pole breed. It has calving ease similar to Angus and uh, carcass qualities uh, that would be similar to Angus. So we uh, have about an eighth of our composite would be red pole. And we've also used Devon genetics. The Devon breed is, uh, we first got interested in when my wife and I went on our honeymoon in New Zealand and saw some of the cattle that are raised on grass on, uh, in New Zealand. They are, uh, as far as their size and scale and adaptivity to grazing and grass-based systems, we felt that they would make a, a, a positive contribution to our composite, um, some early maturity and fleshing ability. And so uh, we have about an eighth Devon in our composite. So the result, this is some yearling heifers that are out on grass, is that uh, we have this, this composite breed, which again is about three eighths Red Angus, a quarter Tarente, and then one eighth Devon, one eighth South Devon, one eighth Red Pole. We use our entire cow herd is made up of that composite. We raise all of our own bulls, just selecting on maternal traits. We try to select our bulls out of the modest size, easy fleshing, perfect uttered, great disposition cows, trying to propagate those, um, those fitness and convenience traits and trying not to emphasize the, the growth and the production traits of, of um, higher milk production and higher mature weight. Because in our system, having that cow that will go out and get bred and raise a calf trumps any sort of high production and high performance that uh, is available in US genetics. So we try to do it with this modest package and we build the performance in our cattle by getting some age on them, carrying them over as yearlings and uh, 
providing that feed yard with an animal that is well suited to go into the feed yard, be fed a uh, high grain ration and be fat at an optimum weight and an optimum time of the year. And obviously a big part of our composite development is that we're a big believer in crossbred cattle. Even though our cattle look like a purebred now, we pretty much have them so that they are very uniform in their type and their size and their, their production um, uh, characteristics. However, having all of those five breeds contributing to our composite definitely improves our fertility. We, we feel like we have really high fertility, not only because of the breeds we selected, but the hybrid vigor and the heterosis that we get from those five breeds. So again, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today and uh, let's uh, all eat more beef. Thank you.